Dr. Jafali, maybe we start with you because this <coughs> is a bit your, your, your idea. You sparked this brain forum. Uh, I said at the beginning, introducing you, uh, you're a global entrepreneur. You also studied neuroscience yourself. Uh, and, uh, and then you decided that your way to promote the field was to convene something like the brain forum and create this platform. Why this was your priority? Well, uh, let me tell you my uh, infant story with, with science and neuroscience. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I just became an infant science, an infant scientist. I decided at age uh, 52 to go back to university and uh, to go out of the norm, which my 72 was, or 76 was my graduation in business administration. I decided to go for science and neuroscience in specific as the brain was taking up my brain capacity of how it functions. Parallel to that, it was uh, the genetic blood norms, which I was always questioning myself of where things would happen and why things are happening, why our normal values established, by who, etc., etc. So I started questioning myself on these. And um, that propelled me literally into, the, say, uh, into the, the, the field of science, but actually very lately in life, at the age of 52, 53. And um, as, as an outside-the-box person or an entrepreneur, I kept on asking myself, why is this in the science world or sector going very different and results are being waited so long, plus coordination of information, collation of, of figures, collation of researchers are not happening, you know, when it comes to brain for, uh, to, to, to brain etc., neuroscience in, in specific. Um, so I set up an initiative, uh, which is a charitable non-profit organization based in Switzerland. W Science. W Science Initiative. And one of its first uh, initiatives was the forum in specific. We started that last year, and that was 100% funded us at that time. Now we have a bit more funding coming in from our partners. So this is our second forum this year. Secondly, uh, the second um, line I went into was to actually collation of various researches and information that is happening around the world. And I found out that really not SAP or a a mega-sized computer can collate and can collect this, leave alone its non-availability uh, to the public and to various institutions. So I thought this part of this initiative could collaborate and could promote this idea. And through the forum, I can see as a first result today, we are beginning to talk about the various initiatives and realizing, Bruno, the, the, the deficiency we have with this wonderful information that we do not share amongst each other and what would it harm? You know, we're talking um, uh, universities, academians, scientists, even companies. So I am hoping the fruits are there for us and ripe and there for us to tear down if this dialogue continues. So there is one interesting thing, and then I will ask the same question to answer your quiz, but there is an interesting thing happening in philanthropy, which is, used to be that the philanthropist would, philanthropist would write a check, give it to a charity or to some organization, and then just let them do. And now philanthropists seem to have a, a, a stronger active role in defining priorities and in, in pushing the projects they're interested in. Uh, you seem to be in that camp. Yes, but, I, I, I was in both camps. Uh -huh. Now, lately, I've, in the last 15 years, to have a hand on, actually, and to get the message through of what my colleagues and I in that charity are preaching and are aiming for, had to be a collective measure and had to be a supervised way in a way or another. Mm -hmm. 
to see, to getting that our money's worth. I worked a lot outside the science world, in Africa, in the Far East, in the Middle East, and it was very intangible. So I wanted tangibility to come through that. So this is where we are expanding into that field. Measurable, measurable impact as, yes, as, as measurable. well. Uh, Mr. Wiss, some of the people in the room here this morning visited the biotech campus in uh, Geneva, which happened primarily because of you. Uh, you have a long history as a philanthropist. You have uh, focused first on environment and conservation, and then more recently on neuroscience and biology. How did the idea for the campus biotech in Geneva come? How did that project happen? I think we have to start first with the Institute for Neuro, for Bio Neuroengineering, mm -hmm. because without that, as a nucleus at the beginning of a discussion, there wouldn't be any any campus biotech. What happened to me is uh, there is a delegation from Switzerland visited the Wies Institute in Boston. And I got an interesting uh, email from a gentleman I didn't know. I said, this is kind of an interesting guy. Why don't I give him a call? It happened to be Patrick Habisher, <laughs> who was the first who gave me feedback and said, this is an interesting concept. Let's talk. So the next thing I called him, I invited him to the United States, and I said, Let's do something in Switzerland. I've done a little bit for museums, I've done a little bit for art schools, etc. But let's do something that is new, it's different. Start with some ideas. And then we both decided that really neuroengineering has made little progress. Now that's my opinion, my assessment as a layperson. I think hearing aids haven't made the progress they should have, you know. All these diseases from macular degeneration to retina thing has made basically no pro progress. Yeah, it's made progress in the labs, it's made progress in writing papers, right. it's been researched, but it hasn't benefited the patient. It hasn't done that. So Patrick and I sat together and said, this is the field we want to do something, and then we discussed a little bit, and the rest is history. Now, because we started that, then one needed a suitable location. I really didn't want it on the campus of EPFL, nor ETH, nor any other university. I wanted it outside. So there is a connection to EPFL. We're very happy about that. We're excited about it. It's fantastic. But at the same time, I wanted the researcher to be a little bit away. So Ernesto Vettorelli came to me and said, let's buy the building. We created biotech, and we put the Wies Institute. And then Patrick said, this is exciting. It's a beautiful <coughs> building. Let's fill it. And let's all work and think around the brain. That's history. This is the building, is actually the campus in Geneva that was left yeah, empty yeah. after Merck old, Yeah, it was the old down. research yeah. building of Merck. Exactly. Which came up for sale. Exactly. So one of the organizations that's housed there is the VISA Center. The VISA Center finances research. But it seems to me that it focuses on one specific thing, which is, let's call it the last mile. How do we get from research to actual products and cures. And uh, tell us about why do you focus on that specific Because element. it's simple in one sentence. I like to bring change. I like to bring positive change. I like to influence a lot of people with positive developments. And if we can get something from the lab and the science, etc., into the hands of eventually industry, you know, and disseminate to the patients who are needing to, who need to be cured, who have a disease, who can't hear anymore, then that's the kind of change I want to bring, and hopefully we will succeed. So it's for the, it, I like to improve patient care. <coughs> yes. <laughs> that's it. Professor Ebisher, <coughs> from your perspective, from that first email that you sent out into cyberspace, hoping for an answer to today, it has been an incredible thing. You know, I do remember we were visiting with our minister, Mr. Burkhalter, the VIS mm -hmm. Institute. I had heard about uh, Hans Jörg, you know, through articles and what he has done over there. And I was really, you know, uh, amazed to see what he has done over there. So I, it's true, I wrote him an email. 
Usually he never answers emails, so don't try. <laughs> <laughs> but by miracle, he answered. <laughs> I did it by phone. <laughs> yes, after. Yeah. So, but, but I think, you know, <laughs> beyond that, I think what is great is what Hantjok is doing through uh, this, this, this Institute for Neuroengineering. He's filling the gap. Because I think, you know, we have in universities a lot of basic research we've heard today. We have great engineering in this school, computer science, mathematicians, and so on. But then we have young people that want to bring it to, but you know, it is very difficult to go from those initial discovery to the human patient. And you need to mature. So we have various ways of doing startups and so on, but often they go too early. Too much money goes into it right. and people spend a lot of time, you know, writing business plan, looking at the and instead of just m maturing. And you know, what Hans Jörg allows us to do with John who will head it today, is really to mature those things, you know, and to go into, you know, phase one, two clinical trials. We are able to hire at the VIS people that we wouldn't hire in university, people with business experience, IP experience, and so on, without already being into the business. But people that have this knowledge, because, you know, those, and people like him have had a great, you know, knowledge of how to bring those to products and really to help people. And I think often we have this, this, you know, this, uh, we call it death valley and so on, between the concept and, and this. And this gives value to that. It allows us to do it fast with, you know, significant resources. So I think it will help, you know, uh, uh, those development of clinical products. I think without, you know, philanthropy, we wouldn't be able to do it. Because you don't have the instruments in the public sector. It's very important to keep the public sector support. But then, before commercializing, and, so, and you need, by the way, to commercialize. Because if you don't commercialize, patient will not you know, benefit from it. But you need something in this state. And I think that's where this significant philanthropy helps us to mature. So it is a fantastic challenge you know, for us. But I think we have now in Geneva a unique you know, uh, concentration. And the fact that you know, uh, Hans Jörg forced us to some extent to do it on what I call on neutral ground, <laughs> you know. Not only that we have EPFL, we have University of Geneva, we have the University Hospital. So you bring all those people, and it is a different environment than the usual environment. And I think that's what Hans Jörg has done also at Harvard. Mm -hmm. He has forced the people. It's not, you know. So uh, that's the can. Now we have to put all this together. You have to have the critical mass, and you have to have environment which is conducive. Of course, I would have never built uh, such a beautiful, lavish building. But when you receive it, why not? <laughs> why not? Right. Why not? Uh, Mr. Rees, you have a long history as a philanthropist, although biotech and neuroscience are more recent. From, from your past activities as a philanthropist in conservation and environment, etc., are there any lessons that you have learned that you now use for science, for supporting neuroscience? What's your method as a philanthropist? Well, first of all, I learned a long time ago that you can't take it with you, okay? It's rather difficult to take all that money with you when you die. So to explain myself We're going to talk clearly. about the giving pledge in a moment. Okay, okay, okay. Secondly, as I said, I don't know if I learned anything because every project is new. Uh -huh. Every project that I do is a new, it's a new challenge, it's a new area. But when I come back to the science thing and following what Patrick said, I learned quite a long time ago that if you're a lone engineer or a lone professor of medicine alone, and you want to get it where it's ready for the clinic, you don't have the means nor the experience. You need engineers, you need doctors, you need physicists, you need mathematicians, you need IT people, you need mechanics, you need everybody in the same room working on a project. If you can create that kind of cooperation, among different fields. I think they have fun, I have fun, and it will be a successful institute. So that's, but you know, many pro, all the projects I've done are so different that it's hard to answer your question, what did I learn from this one or that one? Uh, we want to open to the question, so do you have a second, uh, but yes. Just uh, on Mr. Wies, I, I couldn't agree with him more about depending on the time, where you are, the project, the subject, you can elaborate and work with it and run with it. Yeah. 
Now, I am not Mr. Ruiz. I'm not even close to him in philanthropy. But it's, I have a modest start, but applying the same principles. The latest was with EPFL, having through the W science, the, bio, bio, yeah, the, 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 the laboratory, the W laboratories. Yes. So we decided, as my experience was at Imperial, I saw these bright, young post-doctorates and doctorates going for their PhDs and post-doctorates really do not have the financial means sometimes or the collective means to go on in life and start their project. And as Patrick said, it's very true that most, they are so ambitious, they have a good idea, but it's mainly the idea and the modest uh, capital is eaten up by pre-operating costs. And indeed, you just opened two days ago a lab next to your yes, headquarters well, in Zurich. Yes, well, is, that is part of the initi um, initiative, the yeah, W yeah. initiative. But we have our first lab, actually, is in EPFL. Uh -huh. Second one will be in uh, working with the students, sponsoring part of students when it comes to neuroscience, etc. And we're thinking of Imperial University. We're thinking of Tokyo University. So I went down to the source, actually. As I studied with them and I found that need and that need to collaborate from inception. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there are some questions from yours. Mr. Wies needs to leave in about a few minutes, it's I think. Fine, fine. But, uh, <laughs> let's see if there are some Don't questions from the about. audience. If you do have questions, can we get some lights? Yeah. If you do have questions, uh, you can line up behind the uh, I microphones. I'd like to add something. To yes, please. Thing. I think I want to add something to your previous question. What did I learn? What I learned from the Institute at Harvard and the one here already is when I created a translational institute in Zurich, I saw there in Zurich that two fantastic universities within 200 meters of each other really don't have any common project. Yeah, the president and the, the director, they probably have a yearly dinner and so on. So I forced them. <laughs> I forced them four months ago to come together and create a translational institute of getting projects where all the science is done into the clinic, into the clinicals, and that's the purpose. But you also found, right, when we looked at the first projects, that a professor of medicine who is creating a new way of restoring heart valves in infants and young children on his own was lost without the engineer starting to help him develop the process to make to fabricate these things. So again, I learned that it was a confirmation of my thinking that you need multidisciplinary approach to get these things faster, better, and safer into clinical trials. Uh, Professor Abishan, what Mr. Wies is saying is deserves an applause, but is also troubling for academia. Why? Do we need to wait for this kind of external pressure in order to start collaborating? You know, the way universities are built to some extent is somewhat different, at least traditionally. You know, it's the publish or perish syndrome. It is also something that we have, which is fundamental, is education. You know? yeah. that we have to tra and we transmit this through research. Now we have added a new component, which is tech transfer or valorization, how you call it, this is relatively new as a concept, okay? But now the promotion, the, the incentives inside the universities, and we saw in the discussion before, you know, are different. I think, you know, bringing, and you can see the, the discussion around those various brain initiatives, where, you know, it's very difficult to bring scientists together towards a common goal. It is more feasible in some discipline like physics, you know, when you need an accelerator, so at the end, There's not much choice. you yell inside, but you know, between yourself, but outside you go and so on. When you don't need, in the life science and so on, you know, each time, you looked at, you know, the, we have the same thing when we're doing the human genome project. There were, when I went back to read some of this literature recently, it's amazing how violent those discussions were, you know? Yeah. This is a process of science. So, you know, there is already now between the investigators based and the big science, and now we're being asked to translate. So it is also the funding mechanism, the promotion is not favoring this. That's why I think it was very interesting when you look at the Allen Institute, which is in between and so on. We will need the basic science because this 
is key for the disruptive discovery, you know. But then you need to add the component. You know, we need in science how to work at various levels. And then also if you want to translate, either the government and so on, but I think it's not because as it becomes more public, uh, more private, I think it's good that there is this transition. And I think when then th this kind of philanthropy comes in, it gives us a freedom and a way to mature things. So I think the government should still be the main funder of basic research because nobody will do it. You know, the Bell Labs, maybe Google can do it today, but there are very few companies that can fund basic research. This is the government purpose. <laughs> but then after, you know, and then you have the private sector, but you have something inside. And as you said, which is interesting, philanthropy became much bigger today than it was. The amounts, you see a lot of people, you know, like Hans Jörg and others and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and so on, that pledge, yep. you know, the research. This is totally new. What is also new is that they get involved in some of the research, okay? Uh, uh, so they bring, and I think it'll be interesting to be, you know, Bill Gates said it, I've been very successful in, as a business, can, you know, those research don't know how to do it. I'm going to show them. The reality is that you show that, you know, it's something, it's a different animal. It's an animal, and I like what Han Chok says, you know, everything is a different experiment. There's no magic way to do it. But I think by bringing and the private and the basic, and you need to bring something in the middle, and I think that's where this very significant philanthropy is coming, is changing the game. And I think yes. it's going to have a major impact in translation research. Uh, um, and because at the same time, you have to be careful that the, that the state doesn't decrease the basic science, because it is very critical. And only the, the public sector can do it. And there is, of course, pressure on the budgets right now. Pressure on the budget and so on. That's why, you know, and to be honest, we were able to do this thing that we did, you know, to buy back a building, to have Ernesto and him decide to buy back, to, uh, you know, create the VIS Center for Neuroengineering and so on, it would have taken in a regular budget process five to six years. And I, I went to the opposite. We received a building that was empty, the biggest 40,000 square meters I've never had. So I had to do the opposite, is to fill the building. And now the journalist says, it's still not full, you know. So I had this other kind of pressure, you know, which is, and I think it's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. So we were, of course, we were very, you had a unique opportunity, but now we're gonna be able to create something totally unique with about a thousand, you know, neuroscientists at one location coming from all different fields. This was, the, you know, the catalyst. We could have never done it through state. Yeah. And what, what Hans-Jörg and Ernesto allowed us to do was to catalyze the process, you know. And what, uh, what it does to do this meeting and so on, it's also to catalyze, to put people together. That's where I think that philanthropy could do because the process, the usual process of public and so on, is a complex, very bottom-up, democratic, and you need it but you need to find the right mixture of processes to move. Uh, Mr. Ries, you seem to be focusing a lot also, of course, on giving young people an opportunity. Recently, you have started, for example, supporting Venture Kick, which is one of the organizations yes. that uh, support startups and uh, would-be startups. Those were, those were moving into, into yes. trying to become uh, or start a, a, a company. Assuming that that's becoming one of your key axes of activity supporting startups? Well, I have started a, you know, I shouldn't do it at my advanced age, <laughs> but uh, I've started a number of uh, uh, biotech companies. Uh, right now, in the last, last, you know, last 12 months, which of course, uh, half of them will fail, half of them will never get anything out, but I'm gonna keep doing that. And I have, sub I have another project now coming but again, I want to give a fund where young people can have some access to money, some access to startup money. It might be small, it might be larger, because again, if you can, if you can give young people a chance and at the same time help them a little bit, like Patrick said, out of their inexperience, you know, and, pay the, and, and teach them that profitability in a little company is not important, it's cash flow. You know, you've got to talk to them about cash, cash, cash. They think if they make money, they can succeed. You know, it's some simple, if you can, with some simple truth, help them, it's kind of fun. And then it keeps me young. 
Not many people can say I started a number of companies last 12 months. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, but with other people. You know, it's not me. It's other people who created the science and others who helped to finance. I don't do it alone. Because alone, I'm not good enough. <laughs> Never been good enough. <laughs> That's a big sign of modesty. Uh, any question? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have a question, but just uh, a small comment or a suggestion. Uh, I'm Dr. Shusha, Assistant Professor of Neurology from Saudi Arabia. I had been amazed by your influence to the brain uh, projects all over. But uh, just a suggestion, why were the Brain Forum uh, accommodate the idea of scholaring the young, young physician or the young scientist who would like to be an annual scholarship for the, any brain project, uh, neither for the scientist or for the physician themselves? Thank That's you. a question I assume for well, is that the brain forum actually if I understand can create scholarships <coughs> Well, the, it's not in its mission statement that thing could be handled by other entities for the mission statement of the brain forum as it's registered here that doesn't stand in its mission forum it's its forum mission I mean but of course there are possibilities uh, there are many other yeah. possibilities of course and we could be looking at that, but... Uh, Any other question? I know you need soon to go, but I want to ask you a question that's maybe a little bit more personal about yes. what uh, Professor Abishar has mentioned before, the giving pledge. Uh, two weeks ago, I was with Big Gates in Canada, and I was reminded that uh, you are the only Swiss who has signed the giving pledge. The giving pledge is this initiative by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett inviting the richest people in the world to give, to commit to give away most of their wealth uh, in philanthropic initiatives and, and other, other ways. You're the only Swiss who has signed it. What's the meaning of that for you? Well, I don't want to comment about the other Swiss, but... <laughs> <laughs> but what about you? But, well, the meaning for me is this. Once you have taken care of your family, okay, and the grandkids are already have too much in, too much money, it's going to spoil them. Once you've taken care of the nurse that is now 95, visited her a few days ago, who took care for the last 20 years of my mother, make sure that she has a decent life. She has no pension or anything else. So you've taken care of the people who helped you, who helped your family, the people who have made you successful. And you've taken care of all that. Then what do you want to do with the money except give it away and do something positive? It's such a simple equation. It's, it's so... It, it, I, I don't have any other answer. <laughs> I don't have any other answer. Thank and I you. have everything I need. You know, and uh, Thursday night I was interviewed in Bern by somebody. And they said, well, you know, you seem to remain a normal person, everything else, and how do you do that? I said, well... I always buy a multi-trip ticket in the Bernese tram, so I'm forced to, to ride the, the to tramway in Bern and don't have a driver, and that keeps you in touch. Then you know you have to give it away, you know. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was thank fun you. to be here. And I the thank session you is not over, you but uh, answer week, Patrick Abisher, Walid Fali, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, I'll see you. That was the second point. Huh? Thank you. Thank you.